Hello, chemists, and welcome to this episode of Crowded Beaker. Uh, today, I'm answering a question that was posted in the comments of a previous video I did a while ago called Tips for the Perfect Titration. And I thought it was an excellent question posted by Henry J. And you can see that in the comments. Thank you for the question, by the way. And it was an important question, so I thought we should really spend a minute or two talking about it. And I will post this, the link to this, uh, to the original video in this description, and I'll post this video in the description for the original video so that they're always together and that you can find them. So let me first read the question um, that was posted. It says, how do you account for the fact that phenethylene turns pink at a pH of 10 and back to clear at a pH of 8.3? When you reach the endpoint, the solution is still basic. It would seem that the measured malaria, molarity of HCl is the amount it took to make the solution 8.3 and not seven, that's implied. None of the titration formulas I've seen seem to account for the fact that it's still basic and not seven and not exactly one to one. What am I missing here? And that is an excellent question because we are assuming, for example, for a strong acid, strong base titration, the instant that the acid is neutralized by the base, the pH should be seven. So why are we using an indicator who, which changes its color between 8.3 and 10? And totally valid question. And I want to show you um, how uh, a justification for that. I could just, you know, take the easy way out and say, well, the pH changes rapidly at the equivalence point. But I want to show you using uh, calculations that I would use, say, in a class um, to teach this same idea. So <clears throat> let's talk about a hypothetical titration in which we're going to titrate some hydrochloric acid with some sodium hydroxide. So it should turn pink at the end point. Um, making water and salt. That's a typical uh, acid-base reaction. 50 milliliters of 0.1 molar HCl, let's assume we have that, and we're going to titrate it with 0.1 molar NaOH. Now, since the molarities are the same and it is a one-to-one -one ratio, we would expect 50 milliliters of NaOH being added, and we would expect that to be the end point. Okay, and so let's follow the pH during the whole titration. Uh, this may be eye-opening for you. And I want to actually calculate the pH, this is theoretical, before any NaOH has been added, after 25 milliliters has been added, so we're halfway to the equivalence point. The 49.9, we're almost there. There's the equivalence point, and then a little bit beyond. So let's just see what happens. And then we'll come back and talk about the uh, answer to that question. So... Um, if you need to brush up on some calculations, this might be a, a good little brush up for you. Um, if you have questions, you can always put them in the comments as well. So before any NaOH is added, we simply have a solution of a strong acid, hydrochloric acid. And so the pH of that solution is just the negative log of its molarity. And so that works out to be a pH of one. So our original solution would have a pH of one, very low, and my indicator would not have turned pink at that moment. Let's see what happens halfway to that equivalence point. When I'm titrating along, I'm going along, I got my burette open, it's dripping, 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 and I get to 25 milliliters of NaOH having been added. So I'm halfway there. And you might think that the pH then would be halfway between one and seven, but it's actually not. Because if I do a little ice table and I calculated millimoles here, um, you may or may not have done millimoles before, but there's five millimoles of acid in the original solution. Two and a half millimoles of OH have been added. And I get that number by taking the milliliters, 25 milliliters, times its molarity, 0.1. And this is going to react completely. So this is going to go completely away since it's the limiting reactant down to zero. And half of the acid will have gone away. So we're leaving 2.5 millimoles of the acid. And we made some water too, but that's not going to affect the pH at all except for the fact that it may affect the pH slightly when you add it into the water that's already there. But we're kind of sticking to the major ideas here today. The new H plus concentration is 2.5 millimoles. Now it's in 75 milliliters of solution for a new molarity of 0 0.033. And the pH, if I take the negative log of that, is only 1.48. So I'm halfway to the equivalence point and my pH has not gone up much at all. It's a little bit, but not a lot. Um, and so I wouldn't see anything happening with my indicator. All right, let's get where the real action happens. Let's say I'm titrating along 
and I am just about there. I have my 50 milliliters of acid in there and I'm added, I've added 49.9 milliliters of sodium hydroxide. And so that means 4.99 millimoles. I redid my ice table, five millimoles. This is gonna still go away because it's the limiting reactant, but almost all of the hydrogen has been consumed leaving only one hundredth of a millimole left. Okay, that's not a lot, but, and the water was made over here. If I calculate the new hydrogen ion concentration, 0.01 millimoles in 99.9 .9 liters, which is the total now of everything I've put in there, I get a molarity of 1.0 times 10 to the minus fourth. All right, and that includes sig digs. And if I take the negative log of that, my pH is only four on the pH scale. Like, think about that. I'm like one drop away from the equivalence point and I'm only at a pH of four. All right, and hopefully you agree with my calculations here, but that's, that's why the pH stays really low for a really long time. You have an excess of a strong acid, so the pH stays very low. Okay, let's keep going. This is where the fun begins. Let's say I get to the point where I've added exactly 50 milliliters of NaOH. I've, I've just totally matched it up. And I've added, that adds e equals five millimoles of OH. Now I've got five and five, so it's a stoichiometric ratio. It's exactly one to one. They're both gonna annihilate each other, producing five millimoles of water and zero of either one of the hydrogen ion or the hydroxide ion. So in that case, we just have a solution that is now neutralized. It's pure water which would have a pH of seven, negative log of one times 10 to the minus seven. Water will naturally produce this much H plus concentration in, if you leave it alone, it kind of naturally does that, which is why the pH of water is seven. But then what happens, I add one more drop. After I add that one more drop, I go one more drop. Now I have 5.01 millimoles of OH and I've annihilated all of my hydrogen ions, and I have an excess of 0.01 millimoles of OH now because it's now the excess reactant. Calculating its concentration, 0.01 millimoles in 100.1 milliliters total now, I get a 1.0 times 10 to the minus fourth moles per liter OH. The negative log of that is the pOH, which is four, but subtracting that from 14 is a pH of 10. Okay, so, to make it more visual, I made a graph. And I wanna show you this graph. This is a graph using of the data points that I just uh, calculated. So adding NaOH added, so the volume in milliliters is down here and we got to 50. So here's, here's what happens. In a, if you graph the pH during a titration, regardless of titration, you're gonna have a very steep area right near the equivalence point. Because on one side of the steep curve, you're gonna have an excess of an acid. Maybe this acid hasn't been used up and there's just extra acid floating around, so the pH is low. You get to the equivalence point and then you have now an excess of the base, whatever base you are using. And this actually happens a lot. And, and this part of the graph is so steep. Imagine one drop can take you from here to seven, up to 10, that may be two drops or even one drop in some, in some cases. And let's say the, the phenothaline changes color somewhere in this range here, during that range, it, it's okay because that may have taken only one drop to do it. And that drop may have taken us past the seven up to the 10, which is well within the range of the phenothaline. And you're right in the question, Henry, thank you for uh, pointing this out. Um, pH indicators usually change color over a range of one or two pH units. And what we try to do is pick a indicator whose range of change is somewhere within the steep part of our pH graph, if we were to graph the pH during the titration. And so, yes, it's a bit a little bit of an assumption. And yes, it is slightly basic when that thing starts to turn pink but it's like a drop or less. And so for most applications, it's close enough and it's good enough that we can get an idea of what our molarity of say our hydrochloric acid is or our sodium hydroxide is to a reasonable amount of accuracy. Uh, chemists kind of work with what we have 
And that indicator works very well simply because the pH changes so drastically at the equivalence point. And that happens for uh, most titrations. Here's another uh, image I, I used. This is actually the pH of a weak acid being titrated with a strong base. But again, the pH is very, very steep at that equivalence point. And between a pH of 8 and 10, we would get that color change. And it, it works for us. So yes, it is a bit of an assumption. I understand your question, and I love it. Um, but it's close enough because of that graph that we can uh, actually use phenethalin and get pretty good results. So thank you for the question. I invite anyone else to throw questions in the comments as well. And I will respond to you and let you know about this video as soon as it is ready to go. So thank you, chemists, and I uh, hope this was helpful. And in the meantime, happy solving and have a great day.